All right, folks, I got 12.02, so let's get started. This is also being recorded, so if colleagues do join late, you can always rewind and play through the recording. I'm Sasha Binder, one of the adult respirologists at the Centenary site, and today, I'm. if we talk about everything that is in COPD, that would be far more than a 45-minute presentation. So we're going to focus specifically today on pharmacologic therapy using our 2023 brand new CTS guidelines on pharmacotherapy and stable COPD. I've tailored this also for hospital-based clinicians because in the community, we see the entire spectrum of COPD from very mild early disease to severe frequently exacerbating disease. But the reality is as a hospital-based clinician, hospital-based physicians as we are, we generally will see the more severe end of the spectrum, the symptomatic end of the spectrum, and I'm targeting pharmacotherapy for these individuals. Just by way of disclosures, I do consult, speak, and advise every respiratory company and device manufacturer in the country. I do some, have some additional disclosures with respect to biologics manufacturers, Humber River Hospital, and the Canadian Thoracic Society. I do design content for four content providers at a national and international level as well. I'm the, one of the three practicing respirologists at the Centenary site. I also have an office in Scarborough, office in Ajax, and if you're on the Maple platform, I am the Ontario Respirologist for Maple. So I've highlighted this already that we're going to talk about the 2023 CTS guideline on pharmacotherapy and COPD, really targeting for the hospital-based clinicians to allow us to match pharmacologic therapy to clinical status of individuals with stable COPD and work towards personalizing therapy based on individual characterization. We'll start with a review of the burden of COPD, exacerbations, mortality risk. We'll talk about the algorithm. I'll emphasize triple therapy. And specifically, I'm going to speak to Trelogy 100 because we have two formulations of single inhaler triple therapy available in Ontario. Only one of them at present is on formulary, Trelogy 100. We're working to have the second triple called Brez Tree brought onto formulary. But for now, we have one option with respect to single inhaler triple therapy. We'll also look at some of the data supporting triple therapy and prompt initiation in hospital. As I mentioned, I could spend an entire afternoon talking about COPD and I would take up a fair bit of your time. Uh, I don't need to talk too much about acute exacerbations because one of the things that I've seen in chart review and also on the consult service that we're doing very well is managing acute exacerbations in the emergency department. And what we're also doing very well is having our friendly neighborhood respirologists come to see patients in a timely manner to co-manage during that hospitalization. But some points on acute exacerbations. Inhaled therapy is the objective of today. I want us to be cognizant of the fact that inhalers are expensive. Each inhaler is around $100. That's a fair number for you to have in your mind. Once it's dispensed, it's sunk cost. So if 20 doses of a pill go to the ward and the dose has changed, those 20 doses can generally go back to pharmacy. Once an inhaler is dispensed, even if the patient doesn't take a puff, once it's at the bedside, it can't be reused, it's sunk cost. So if inhaler therapy from home is continued and then the respiratory consultation service comes or you come along and make a change, that inhaler that was dispensed, that's $100 gone. That's a significant cost to our, to our system, to our hospital as well. The purpose of today is to make sure that we have the right inhaler for that patient with an exacerbation at the right time during that hospitalization. Exacerbations, very reasonable to use short-acting beta agonists, be it MDI or nebulized. MDI, of course, is, pre is preferred. Beta receptors are upregulated in number and density during exacerbations. Patients become more beta responsive. It is fair to add atrovent, but there's a caveat here. Cholinergic receptors tend to remain stable in number and density during exacerbation. So if the patient is reliably on a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, they're reliably on a drug that blocks that receptor, adding atrovent onto that is not going to have much in the way of additional therapeutic effect. It will actually just lead to adverse effect. Now, of course, in the first 24, 48 hours of an exacerbation, I can't guarantee that the patient is reliably taking their controller therapy, that they're reliably getting the full dose. We err on the side of caution by adding atrovent onto that patient's regimen. 
but that's one of the first medications I discontinue once I'm convinced that they're reliably taking a LAMA. Systemic corticosteroids improve lung function, improve oxygenation, shorten recovery time, shorten hospital duration, decrease the risk of relapse. But an exacerbation of COPD is not vasculitis, folks. Treating these patients with high doses of corticosteroids, 125 milligrams Q8, 40 BID, 40 TID, that is a high burden of prednisone. In the asthma world, we see clear data that prednisone is like radiation. There is no safe dose. And the cumulative lifetime dose of prednisone exposure is becoming a key marker in respiratory medicine. These patients don't require whopping doses of prednisone. The inflammatory burden of a COPD exacerbation is not a light switch. It's not going to turn off instantly. It will take time. More prednisone at the start doesn't show that it's going to decrease the time it takes for that to resolve. Five days of therapy is sufficient. The REDUCE trial published back in 2012 showed 40 milligrams a day for five days orally was just as effective as 14 days of 40 milligrams. No difference at six months. Oral is preferred. Antibiotics, reduce recovery time, reduce the risk of relapse, treatment failure and hospitalization duration. Oral is preferred. And the 2023 recommendation from GOLD is five days of treatment. Some other factors though come into play. Remember that bacteria need to be killed. Antibiotic are bullets. More bacteria, you need more bullets. That's why, for example, if a patient's CAT scan shows bronchiectasis, our guidelines for bronchiectasis will say 14 to 21 days of antibiotics. You have more mucus in bronchiectasis, more bacteria. As a result, you need more bullets, longer treatment course. Other factors do come into play, and sometimes we will extend the antibiotic course given the burden of sputum, the radiographic picture. You can always extend. Five days is very reasonable. Most common sputum result when you do test it is normal respiratory flora. If you're looking for guidance as to which antibiotics, this is hard to come by. And also local epidemiological data with respect to flora is also hard to come by. Our 2008 CTS guidelines for COPD had some recommendations on the severe end, clavulin and avalox, which I've listed here. But looking at the gold 2023 document on the milder, moderate end of the spectrum, azithromycin and doxycycline for five days, all very reasonable. So briefly touching on acute exacerbations, moving to inhaled therapy. There are 63 inhalers that you can prescribe in the province of Ontario. By the end of this year, it's probably gonna be 67 inhalers. There are 25 inhalers for COPD. It is an absolute mess of medications. By the end of this presentation, I'm gonna simplify it so that this is all you need to know. Your short-acting beta agonist of choice, it's almost always Ventolin. Rarely do we prescribe Bricanil. Long-acting muscarinic antagonist of choice, there are three evidence-based options. Dual bronchodilator Lama Laba of choice, there are three options. And single inhaler triple therapy. There are two options. At present in our hospital, it is Trelegy 100, one option on formulary. We spend a lot of time talking about COPD for very good reason. It is a very common disease globally. It is the third leading cause of death worldwide. The cardiologists still have the silver and gold medal from ischemic heart disease and stroke. Neurologists sharing that silver medal as well. Bronze for, for respiratory with respect to COPD is the third leading cause. The second most common cause of emergency admission in some countries, I'll show you the Canadian data. And unfortunately, Patients with COPD die respiratory, but also non-respiratory, largely cardiac causes. In Canada, it remains the second leading cause of hospitalization. It is the second most common reason for hospitalization pre-pandemic in 2019 and 2020. Of course, during the pandemic, the data for hospitalization was distorted by pandemic-related factors and healthcare-related measures. I suspect we'll go back to the 2024, 2025 data being similar to 2019. But second only to childbirth, the propagation of our very species, we have exacerbations of COPD and chronic bronchitis. We have around 9% mortality within 30 days of hospital discharge after an exacerbation of COPD. Average length of stay is seven days. This is not an insignificant condition 
an event for the patient, let alone our healthcare system. Exacerbations are the major driver of hospitalization and death. Following one or two hospitalized exacerbations on an annual basis, 50% of patients are dead within five years. Three or more, over 50%. Actually, about 70% of patients are dead within five years, over 50% at three years. The, the cause of patients leaving my practice relates to exacerbations of COPD. One moderate outpatient exacerbation, something that's treated in our offices, increases the risk of hospitalization by 21%. Two or more moderate exacerbations within a year, and your risk of death goes up by 80%. Death is an expected outcome with exacerbating COPD. Two moderate exacerbations in a year, risk of death goes up by 80%. You want to give your patients a number. One in five patients with COPD will die within one year of their first hospitalization. So if you're seeing a patient in the emergency department, you're managing them on the ward or seeing them in consultation, and they're admitted with a severe exacerbation of COPD. Severe exacerbation meaning they've come to the emergency department, they've been hospitalized, or God forbid wound up in the ICU. There's a 20% chance that that person will be dead within 12 months. Despite our best efforts, there is a high risk of mortality. It is worse when we don't optimally treat COPD. It is worse when they're on the wrong pharmacotherapy. I'll pull some Ontario data for you. This is adults over the age of 65. The focus is on the right-hand side of the overall over 65 cohort and 365 day mortality after a severe COPD exacerbation, and it's 27%. A presentation like today is a call to action because we know that as respiratory physicians, we have been late to the game. We're a conservative bunch. And oftentimes in the past, an event would happen. Patients would have a respiratory event. We would start them on a bronchodilator. Another event would happen. We would escalate and we would slowly escalate to triple therapy after multiple events had occurred. The reality is that even having a single hospitalized exacerbation increases the risk of mortality and accelerates the rate of decline of lung function. This is on us as respiratory physicians. You'll see from the 2023 guideline that we are very aggressive early on, and there's no playing around with respect to pharmacotherapy for our exacerbating patients. On the right-hand side, the second call to action. Even after hospitalization, many patients remained untreated. A th about a third of patients had no maintenance treatment for COPD before they were admitted. After admission, about a third continued to have no maintenance therapy. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And if you don't have an intervention of change, history will repeat itself. The past will become your future and an exacerbation is likely to occur again. Our 2019 guideline, which you probably heard me speak on in the past, was a bit complicated. It had many boxes, it had many arrows, it is on the left-hand side. What we've done is we've essentially lopped off the first row of pharmacologic therapy, and we have a more spelt, elegant guideline on the right-hand side. We categorize patients into three groups, and we're going to work through this a bit quickly because I'll summarize for you that in your head, a lot of the decisions that you have to make are made for you by virtue of where you're seeing the patient. Patients that present to hospital with COPD exacerbations or are hospitalized with COPD as a comorbidity are not mild patients. These are patients definitively on the right-hand side of the algorithm. So when I'm seeing a patient in the office, the first thing I'm going to look at is characterizing them based on symptoms. Now, if you have the luxury of time, the COPD assessment test is an eight question, six point Likert scale that looks at various domains affected by COPD. We don't do this in clinical practice that often. It's time consuming. Um, I think if I polled all Ontario respirologists, I'll get a smattering of those who work in academic centers who say that they do this, but they probably do it for every single patient, whether they have COPD or not, just to make life easy. It's difficult and it's time consuming, but the questions are things that we're asking patients anyways. Cough, sputum, chest tightness, exertional dyspnea, activity limitation. There's also three questions that we really should be asking, but we often don't. Confidence leaving the home, quality of sleep, energy level. If a patient scores 10 or higher on this CAT score, 
that indicates that COPD is a major medical condition affecting quality of life. The CAT score is liked by researchers because score increases by two or decreases by two. It's a clinically significant worsening or improvement, respectively. The CAT score is something you can get a good gestalt for, and it doesn't take much to get a score of 10. Over 50% of the patients that you see in the ED and on the ward or in clinic are going to be on the right-hand side in the moderate and severe cohort. There's not a lot of asymptomatic mild COPD floating around there unless you actively capture it with screening. And most patients with COPD are not captured by screening. What I use in clinical practice, which is very effective, I think I like it because it gives me a good sense of what the patient is actually doing in real life, is the modified MRC score of breathlessness. One question you need to ask, walking on level ground at your own pace, do you have to stop because of shortness of breath? Do you have to slow down to avoid having to stop? And can you keep up with a peer your own age? If a patient has to stop because of shortness of breath, slow down to avoid having to stop, or can't keep up with an age-matched peer, they have modified MRC class two or worse exertional dyspnea. They're on the high risk side of the algorithm. If you have moderate, severe, or very severe COPD, more than half of the patients fall on this side of the algorithm. So you can see that this is your domain. You don't really see mild patients. We move on to the second domain, lung function. Now, I am confident that unless myself or one of my colleagues has put this in our consult note, or the patient has had their PFT at Centenary, where you can see it in chart review under scanned items or procedures, you won't have access to this. You won't have this information in terms of their lung function. You may ask the patient, can you tell me the severity of your COPD? Is it mild, moderate, severe, very severe? Bless them if they know. Many, unfortunately, won't. Some of them will know just from a dichotomous perspective that it's severe or not, but that doesn't really give you much help. Laws of probability though are on your side. 70 to 80% of community diagnosed COPD on the right-hand side from two different cohorts are moderate or worse. Mild COPD is the minority. Mild COPD makes up between 20 to 30% of cases. And again, you capture mild COPD generally through targeted screening. If you're a betting person, at least 70 to 80% of the patients that you're seeing will have moderate, severe, or very severe COPD. Again, you're on the right side of this algorithm. The beauty about our algorithm, though, is that the factor that has greatest risk for the patient trumps. So exacerbations trump lung function and trump symptoms. If you have a severe exacerbation requiring emergency department visit, hospitalization, or ICU, or you have two outpatient moderate exacerbations, irrespective of your lung function or your symptoms, the pharmacologic therapy is driven by what matters most, the exacerbations. If you're on the high risk side, this trumps. For exacerbations, we risk stratify based on the past 12 months, the prior year. Now, as you know, an exacerbation is less than 14 days of increasing dyspnea, plus minus sputum volume increase, plus minus purulence, or even the feeling that the sputum is sticky in the chest. Severe exacerbations are ED, hospital, or ICU. You're on the property of a hospital, and it's a severe exacerbation. Moderate exacerbations are treated in our offices, off the hospital. If you have a hospital clinic, that's a technicality. I'd still call that a moderate exacerbation. If you believe that every patient that you see with COPD and every patient out there is frequently recurrently exacerbating, that's incorrect. In fact, 75% of patients are infrequently exacerbating. In one of our landmark three-year cohort studies called Eclipse, 23% of patients in that trial of over 2,000 patients did not have an exacerbation over three years. The minority of patients frequently exacerbate. They drive all of the adverse outcomes and healthcare expenditure in COPD. But high risk exacerbations in COPD make up only 25% of the patients. That's two or more moderate exacerbations as an outpatient or one severe exacerbation. The other three quarters of patients are low risk, infrequent exacerbations. They never went to the emergency department or hospitalized. At the most, one event as an outpatient. 
Now we're gonna work through the individual pharmacologic recommendations and I'll show you the data supporting it. But the goal of today is how to choose maintenance therapy to reduce the risk of exacerbation. Now we're gonna start on the high risk side of the algorithm, high yield, this is what you see in day-to-day -day practice. You have a patient at high risk of exacerbations. They have a moderate to high symptom burden as we've discussed by virtue of where you're seeing them. They have symptomatic exertional dyspnea, they have impaired lung function. The first, the only, the final therapy for this patient is single inhaler triple therapy. If they have two or more moderate or one severe exacerbation in the previous year, the first and final therapy is triple therapy. You have two options, Trelegy or Brestry. We do not mess around by starting them on something less than that. The data supports single inhaler triple therapy. There are two landmark clinical trials in respiratory medicine called IMPACT and ETHOS that guide this recommendation. IMPACT took patients who were having frequent recurrent exacerbations, two or more moderate or one severe exacerbation, and randomized them to three groups, triple therapy with Trilogy 100, ICS LABA with Brio 100, or dual bronchodilator therapy with Anoro. When patients with frequent recurrent exacerbations were randomized to triple therapy with Trilogy, we saw a 25% reduction of moderate or severe exacerbations compared to a Noro, which is a dual bronchodilator. We saw a 15% reduction compared to Brio 100, which is an ICS LABA. Trilogy 100 also significantly reduced hospitalizations by 34% compared to a Noro. So if some of you have long-term care practices or work with long-term care clinicians, you can quickly see that from a respiratory standpoint, preventing severe exacerbations with Trilogy 100 will prevent those patients from having to leave home and go to hospital. The reason why triple therapy is the first and last recommendation for these patients is that if they are on dual bronchodilator therapy or even on ICS LABA like Brio, it is a disservice because they have a higher rate of exacerbation in clinical trial. Single inhaler triple therapy reduces that exacerbation risk and it is a disservice for these patients to continue on dual bronchodilator therapy. Not only do we see a significant reduction of exacerbations, but for the first time in respiratory medicine, a durable mortality signal. I apologize that the legend for this figure is in the generic names, but the top line, amecladinium volanterol UMEC VI is dual bronchodilator therapy, a noro. The maroon line, which is lower on the y-axis with respect to mortality, is single inhaler triple therapy with Trilogy. 28% relative reduction of death from all cause mortality and an absolute risk difference of 0.83%. This is not just respiratory mortality. This will help you if you get hit by a bus. I mean, obviously if you have better control of your COPD, you can make it across the street. You're less likely to get hit by a vehicle. All cause mortality reduction of 0.83%. I told you the jokes don't get any better as the presentation goes on. We have one randomized control trial showing a significant reduction of triple therapy. We have a second in the ethos trial. Now this is for Brestree. This is another single inhaler triple therapy that we are trying to get onto formulary. And compared to dual bronchodilator, Brestree showed a significant reduction of exacerbations. And similarly, compared to ICS LABA, a version of Simbacort in the study, Brestree was superior. Unfortunately, for severe exacerbations only, as per the publication, there was a 16% numerical reduction, but it did not achieve statistical significance. What we did see, however, was a reduction of mortality for Brestree similar to Trilogy. Here, the absolute risk reduction of all-cause mortality was 1%. It is for this reason, on the right-hand side now, the first treatment that is recommended the final treatment for patients with this exacerbating phenotype is single inhaler triple therapy with LAMA, LABA, ICS. There is no backward arrow. You'll recall 
that our previous guidelines for patients in the middle did say that, you know, if the patient is doing well, you could consider de-escalating. No more de-escalation. In patients at high risk of exacerbation with a high symptom burden, we do not suggest stepping down from triple therapy to dual bronchodilator therapy. The evidence for this comes from the ethos and impact clinical trials. We've demonstrated, and here I'm showing Trelogy, which we have on formulary, that single inhaler triple therapy has a significant reduction of exacerbations in patients with this exacerbating phenotype compared to a dual bronchodilator such as a noro. If you de-escalate this exacerbating patient, you are condemning them to a future of an increased risk and a higher frequency of exacerbations. De-escalation is not recommended. Single inhaler triple therapy is the first and final treatment for these patients. Now, for those of whom cover ED, you cover the ward, and you see patients with exacerbations of COPD, at the time of admission, this is the opportune time to initiate single inhaler triple therapy. Your friendly neighborhood respirologist will come by and do the same, but the call to action is implementing this at the time of admission. That will greatly save the money of dispensing sometimes their other regimen from home, which would be replaced in hospital. But of course, once it's dispensed, the money is spent. It is sunk cost. And there is evidence I'll show you at the end for prompt initiation while in hospital. For those of you working in clinic who may see patients who have COPD as a comorbidity or on the ward where you have COPD as a comorbidity, but they're not in hospital because of an exacerbation, but they are symptomatic, our guidelines also give us a guide. Remember, 75% of patients will find themselves on this side in frequent exacerbations. If you have a patient at low risk of exacerbations of COPD, no ER, hospitalizations, at the most one exacerbation, one chest infection in the previous year. But of course, statistically, likely to have moderate or worse disease, 70 to 80%, likely to have MMRC2 dyspnea, they have to stop or slow down at their own pace or can't keep up with a peer. The first treatment for them is dual bronchodilator therapy with a LAMA or a LABA. Of the 63 inhalers, of the 25 in COPD, there's only three in this category. Maximization of airway caliber, minimization of dyspnea, maximization of exercise capacity, and exacerbation reduction comes from a minimum of dual bronchodilator therapy. Now, our Canadian guidelines have taken an aggressive step forward in recommending dual bronchodilator therapy upfront. This does carry on from GOLD, which is the Global Obstructive Lung Disease Consortium that had a recommendation in 2023. And they've relied very heavily on this elegant study called EMAX to arrive at that conclusion. EMAX is the kind of study you want in patients who are essentially treatment naive, exacerbation naive, and with symptomatic disease. They took classic COPD patients, 40 and older, CAT score greater than 10. They're symptomatic. COPD is a major medical condition affecting quality of life. They have moderate to severe disease. They are not receiving inhaled steroid. And at the most, they had one exacerbation in the previous year. I want to further characterize this cohort for you with four key clinical elements on the right-hand side. The heartbreaking aspect of COPD is that patients who don't exacerbate, they don't get a lot of attention. It's like the kid in class who needs a lot of help, but doesn't raise his or her hand, doesn't draw attention to themselves, and they suffer in silence. Whole year goes by, and they move on not receiving the care they needed. Sometimes you have to scream and shout in life. Exacerbations are you screaming and shouting. But if you don't frequently exacerbate, this trial highlights how unfortunate that is for patients. Emax, average age 64, Average duration of COPD, eight years. Baseline CAT score was 19. Now, I told you that 10 or higher means that COPD is a major medical condition impacting quality of life. The baseline score for patients was almost double that. 16% had an outpatient exacerbation in the previous year. 84% of patients were treatment, where 84% of patients were exacerbation free. They had never had an exacerbation in the previous year. 
31% of patients in this study were on Ventolin only. You've lived with COPD for eight years. Your CAT score is almost 20. Sure, you haven't had an exacerbation, but you're on Ventolin only. That is a shame. And that is why Emacs and our guidelines is a call to action to change the therapy for these patients because Ventolin is necessary across the spectrum of COPD. Ventolin alone is insufficient. Emacs demonstrated that dual bronchodilator therapy with a noro on the left-hand side in red showed a significant improvement of trough FEV1 compared to monotherapy LAMA in cruise in green and LABA Cerevent in gray. I don't think many people on this call uh, are prescribing Cerevent anymore. It is a very old LABA. I think it comes from the Nixon administration. Incruz is one of the newest LAMAs. Anoro is one of the newest LABA LAMAs, dual bronchodilators. And look at the improvement of lung function compared to monotherapy. What I like on the right-hand side as a community and hospital-based physician is freedom from rescue therapy. If I can start a patient on a dual bronchodilator and have a near doubling of the number of days in the month where they are free from having to use Ventolin, that is a win. And Emacs was one of the first studies that looked at a composite endpoint of meaningful outcomes for patients. Exacerbation, moderate or severe, decline of lung function or decline in quality of life. And noticed a significant reduction on dual bronchodilator therapy compared to monotherapy. So it is for this reason that when we have patients at low risk of exacerbations of COPD, that the guidelines ask us to implement dual bronchodilator therapy upfront, LAMA-LABA. Now, if LAMA-LABA is not enough, or it becomes not enough, or the patient has an exacerbation, the guidelines tell us to escalate to triple therapy. But unlike previous iterations of our guidelines, there is no backward arrow. The text is on the left-hand side for your reference, but the arrow that I've put on the right-hand side, accentuating the arrow in the guideline, it's one way. When you escalate therapy in COPD, we no longer de-escalate. If you start a patient on dual bronchodilator therapy and it's not enough from a symptom perspective, it becomes not enough or they have an exacerbation, we escalate to triple therapy, we stay there. The call to action to all of us is that when we're looking at that past medical history in EPIC and we're looking at the corresponding medication list for every treatable chronic illness on the past medical history, we want to see optimal guideline recommended medications to treat. If you see COPD with infrequent exacerbations and you see anything less than dual bronchodilator therapy, start that patient on dual bronchodilator therapy, a LAMA or a LABA. If you see COPD and they are on a triple therapy, do not de-escalate. In fact, I'll show you data at the end to consolidate to one inhaler, but minimum therapy is dual bronchodilator and we do not de-escalate. The data telling us not to de-escalate comes from this trial called Kronos. I apologize, it's a bit of a busy figure. In the middle, we have triple therapy, Brestree. On the left-hand side, we have dual bronchodilator therapy. This was a very interesting study because 74% of patients coming into the study did not have an exacerbation in the previous year. When patients were randomized to dual bronchodilator therapy, they had a higher rate of exacerbation compared to triple therapy. Now, this study and this figure presents it in a different way. It demonstrates that escalating patients from dual bronchodilator to triple in Kronos reduced the rate of exacerbation. Our guidelines rely rather heavily on the reverse. If we have patients that are on triple therapy, they're on triple therapy for the right reason, they were escalated for the right reason, symptoms or an exacerbation. If we de-escalate to dual bronchodilator therapy, they will have nearly a doubling of the rate of exacerbations. For this reason, it is a one-way street. The minimum is dual bronchodilator therapy, and we do not de-escalate. If dual bronchodilators from a symptom perspective is not enough, if it becomes not enough, or if they have an exacerbation, we escalate to triple therapy. Now, your friendly neighborhood respirologist on the consult service is probably going to do one step more because 
if a patient is already on triple, I am going to come around and add some additional therapies. I'm going to consider starting chronic azithromycin in hospital and then collecting sputum for AFB as an outpatient or in hospital, depending on the length of stay. I try to avoid collecting sputum for AFB in hospital because you know what happens. The next morning, the patient comes back. Well, the next morning I come around and they're in an airborne isolation room and there's a huge panic. Um, even though I click that button saying TB is not suspected, that button is only as good to be clicked as it is with an epic. So sometimes bad things happen when you try to do good things. Starting chronic azithromycin in hospital, not unreasonable. And then myself or one of my colleagues will order sputum for AFB as an outpatient, recognizing that we could create resistant AFB if they are on macrolide therapy and colonize. But at the end of the day, this is something we discuss in the office, balancing the harms of creating resistant bacteria with the benefit of preventing exacerbations that has a high likelihood of killing the patient. Mucolytic therapy with N-acetylcysteine and Daxis can be added. The clinical trials show some mixed evidence. Some robust cohorts show strong signals. Some mixed cohorts do not. That's why there's a weaker recommendation. I have no qualms with adding all three of these in addition to triple therapy to keep patients alive longer and prevent exacerbations. To close, I want to talk about the complexity. Now, I have single inhaler triple therapy here on the right-hand side in the form of Trelegy. But let's remember that patients with COPD have many comorbidities. They have a complex medical history. Using multiple devices with different inhaler techniques is a problem. Multiple devices with similar inhalational techniques, that's less of an issue, but it's still a problem when you have multiple devices compared to a single device. There is elegance in simplifying pharmacotherapy to a single device. I will also remind all of us here, and I say this with my wife as an advanced practice nurse at Sunnybrook, now a patient care manager, nurses do not receive regular education in inhaler therapy. It is not part of the standard curriculum through their training either. So multiple inhalers, it leads to a lot of complexity. You know, one of the hardest things in medicine is saying you don't know how to do something. It's very hard uh, to admit to that. Epic during point of medication administration doesn't readily give you access to how to use this inhaler, how to teach and guide your patient. We rely on our pharmacists to do so, but our nurses are also co-administering and helping with this. Simplifying to fewer inhalers with fewer techniques that they have to know and remember and then teach and instruct patients come from a myriad of backgrounds as well, and languages and cultural from, from, from a cultural perspective where inhaler technique can be challenged and intimidating. Keep it simple. Start simple and stay simple. The evidence also supports it. This was an elegant study called Intrepid that looked at improvement in the CAT score, COPD assessment test with Trelegy. Trelegy demonstrated a 31% improvement in the odds of a patient having improved health status from a COPD symptom perspective compared to multiple inhaler triple therapy. It makes sense to have a single inhaler. Patients feel better. On the right-hand side, we see that there's also a significant improvement in lung function compared to multiple inhaler triple therapy. Now, the MCID, how many mils you need to improve for a patient to feel it is around 100 mils. So both of these arms did fall short, but statistically between the two, and this is only a six month study, we did see a difference, statistically significant improvement of lung function. We also prevent what we want to prevent, exacerbations. This is a study in England looking at primary care and reduced exacerbations after switching from multiple inhaler triple therapy to single inhaler triple therapy. Look, many of our patients are on many medications. I myself take 10 pills a day, eight in the evening, two in the morning. Life is complicated, I forget. At the end of the day, the more inhalers our patients have, the more challenging it is for them to remember. Simplifying to a single inhaler reduces exacerbations, be it moderate, severe, or moderate or severe in this cohort from the United Kingdom. But I've commented on this earlier that being prompt matters. And in life, things sure are a heck of a lot easier if you are first. And when it comes to preventing exacerbations, starting triple therapy in hospital 
is a far better approach than delaying. Every 30-day delay from escalating to triple therapy where it is indicated increases the risk of exacerbation by 10%. On the left-hand side, when we look at all-cause readmission to hospital, and on the right-hand side for COPD-related readmission, if you start sooner rather than later, you have a lower likelihood of readmission. COPD re-exacerbation, COPD readmission is a major quality indicator for our hospital, and it is a challenging needle to move. Prompt initiation of triple therapy in hospital means they go home on it, they are familiar with it in hospital. They know how to use it. They use it when they go home. This is a significant reduction. Prompt here is less than 30 days, less than 60 days, less than 90 days. Delayed is greater than that. And that's for all cause or COPD. We went one step further with a study looking at 14 days versus 30 days. And 14 days trumps more so than 30 days. Be prompt. To summarize, for those of you in hospital seeing patients with a severe exacerbation of COPD, ED, hospital ward, or ICU, the first, the last, the final pharmacologic therapy for this patient is single inhaler triple therapy. And you have two options with respect to Trelogy 100 on formulary, Brestry, which we are hoping to get on formulary. The first and final therapy for these patients, single inhaler triple therapy. At present, we do not have data indicating that there is a time point in the future to get to de-escalate from triple therapy. I say this because our studies are one year in length. After that one year, these cohorts are followed. We also have large database studies. So Alexis asked a question in the, in the, in the chat as to, is there a point to scale back? At this point, no. The guidelines indicate that once we escalate to triple, we stay on triple. And this is an indefinite continuation of triple therapy. I agree, we need to get breast tree on formulary. And I've sent a reply to Loretta and the pharmacy team with respect to some of the factors that were raised uh, trying to get uh, breast tree onto formulary. Uh, how do we choose? Well, I'll, I'll, before I go to moderate and mild, I'll just say this, that the data for outcomes from Brestry and Trelogy are similar. Similar reduction of moderate and severe exacerbations, similar reduction of mortality. One of the challenges with respect to dry powder inhaler is that some patients have a preference that they don't like a dry powder inhaler and they like a meter dose inhaler. I will say that for Trelogy and for the Ellipta device, the data shows that even very severe patients can effectively inhale the powder. In my office, most of this comes down to preference, nothing more than preference, because the data in Trelogy shows that it is a once a day medication because the compounds last the full 24 hours, actually around 36 hours. Brestree is a twice a day medication because the compounds have a duration of around 12 hours as listed here. Some of it is patient preference, but technique often can overcome a patient's preference of one versus another. You can't inhale a medication like you're eating a sandwich with your chin close to your chest. You almost want to have the sniffing position where your head is almost looking up at the ceiling and you have a straight shot of powder or mist getting into the airways. That can often adjust. If patients have many medications that are once a day, Trelogy fits. If they find themselves in the kitchen twice a day taking pills, they may prefer Brestree. We also have to recall that everyone is different with respect to receptors. Some patients do find that Trelogy doesn't last the full 24 hours. And when I see them in the office in the afternoon and I have spirometry with a bronchodilator, I see a bit of a bronchodilator response. Does it happen often? It does not. But do patients exist with receptor polymorphism that respond to one compound versus another? Absolutely. The beauty about this is that we have the abundance of choice and we have two options here. With respect to moderate and severe symptomatic disease, but absence of severe exacerbations, absence of frequent exacerbations, you have three options. Anoro, Inspiolto, and Ultibro, all that we have listed on formulary. So if your patient has COPD, they don't have a frequent exacerbation history, but you know by seeing them where you are seeing them that they're symptomatic, and they at least 70, 80% chance of moderate or worse disease, 
The minimum for them should be one of these three, Anoro, Inspiolto, or Altebro. I've shown you the data for Anoro from the Emacs trial. If it becomes not enough in subsequent follow-up, if it isn't enough when you started in terms of symptom control or they have an exacerbation, escalate to triple. Now, I have a practice in Ajax at the Heart Health Institute with a group of 12 cardiologists, and I see many internal referrals for patients referred for cardiac testing with a current or former tobacco history and respiratory symptoms. For these patients, when I screen for COPD, they have minimal symptoms. I mean, they don't have to stop because of shortness of breath. They have mild disease. Ventolin only is insufficient. Ventolin is necessary for every patient, but long-acting muscarinic antagonist therapy or long-acting beta agonist therapy is the recommendation. Of the two categories, LAMA or LABA, there is strong evidence for LAMA. I don't think many here would know a monotherapy LABA because we just don't prescribe it. There's stronger evidence for LAMA. Three options here, INCRUZ, Seabury, and Spireva. All of these well-known on formulary within our hospital as well. Spireva was the first to market, so has probably a greater recognition with respect to name. INCRUZ is the most recent to market and on formulary as well. If you have a patient with mild disease, you're likely not going to see them in hospital, likely not going to see them in the emergency department or hospital clinic. In your practices, you'll capture them with screening. And if you actively screen, this is what you'll find, mild disease. Start patients on a long-acting therapy. They will continue on this indefinitely. Sometimes it's a challenge. Someone says, you know what? I have mild COPD. Why do I need to be on a drug every day? Well, invariably, they often have hypercholesterolemia or hypertension. And I say, why do you take your statin every day? Why do you take your ACE inhibitor every day? There's a logic to this. You have a chronic, irreversible, progressive disease, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, or COPD. Pharmacologic therapy will reduce the likelihood of fatal and non-fatal downstream outcomes. Taking a, an inhaler like a LAMA every day will maximize lung function, minimize exacerbations, and slow the rate of decline. Even though you don't feel it and you're not symptomatic from it, taking therapy now will push that point of symptomatic disease farther into the future. I'll close by saying that the goal of medicine is to allow our patients to die feeling young as late in life as possible. We can't cure COPD. We can't reverse the disease. But optimal treatment and initiating it promptly in hospital and in our offices can allow our patients to do just that. I'm happy to stick around for questions. I have gone through the... Uh, chat and addressed some of the questions. I do want to point out that you will see a triple therapy on a uh, formulary called Enerzare, and it is a single inhaler triple therapy that has a Health Canada indication for asthma. Some of us in practice do use it off-label in COPD, especially when cost is a factor because it is a single inhaler triple. It's essentially Ultibro plus Asthmanex, so Ultibro plus Mometazone. But by the letter, it is indicated only for asthma. Thank you for the opportunity.